Let's discuss four types of commercially available IC packages, specifically dual inline pin packages, sometimes abbreviated as DIP, surface mount packages, pin grid array packages, PGA, and the most common package type for large chips, ball grid array. Now, these package types are arranged from uh, the least complex to the most complex. Complexity usually correlates with the number of available pins so that BGAs have a lot more available pins than DIP uh, packages. And also, uh, complexity you know, negatively correlates with the ease of installation so that DIP packages are really easy to install and ball grid arrays require special machinery. So let's start with the simplest package type, the dual inline pin package. And this is a package type you're very likely to have seen with very simple chips. The simplest of chips are always uh, dip, uh, dip chips. So in dual inline pins, you have pins arranged in two uh, lines on either side of the package. And so they are on the perimeter and usually on only the uh, longer dimension of the rectangle of the package. And the pins, they do um, something very specific. They come out of the package and then they take a very sharp angle, usually a right angle, and then they go down. And so this helps with installing these pins, uh, with, with installing these packages or these ICs in systems. When we talk about installing chips, we talk about integrating them on printed circuit boards or PCBs. We'll talk more about PCBs in the coming video, but PCBs are the platform or the uh, substrate on which components are integrated with each other to form a larger system. So they can contain multiple chips or multiple passive components to form a larger system. And so with DIP packages, installation is, re is really easy. What happens is you dig holes through the PCB and then you just plug in the chip by pushing it into these holes. Now you need to create electrical connections and you also need to create a mechanical bond between the chip and the PCB. And this is really easy to do because all you have to do is you have to solder the bottom of the pins that protrudes out of the, uh, of the, of the PCB. You can also do it on the top. But this is really easy. And it's so easy, actually, that it is usually done manually using um, uh, just a, um, a soldering iron. And you can do it uh, just in a home environment. Again, normally uh, commercial assemblies of PCBs and components is done in a controlled environment. It doesn't really have to be classified uh, clean rooms, but it is usually uh, relatively uh, clean and contains uh, good air conditioning. But if you're doing this as a hobbyist, you can actually do it at home and the results will be uh, fairly good. One of the reasons you can do this at home is because the pins in a dip package are far away from each other. And that's not a good thing, because what it means is that the pitch of the pins is large, which reduces the maximum number of pins that can be fit on a dip package. So the density of pins is small because you have a high pitch between the pins. Okay, so why do we need high pitch? We need a, a large pitch between pins because of this uh, sharp angle that the pins make as they go down. The sharp angle requires that the pins be very wide at their base. And so they are actually wide as they come out of the package and then they narrow down as they go down. But this wideness at the package level is needed to provide mechanical support uh, that allows us to bend the pins down. This is what keeps the pitch high and keeps density of pins low, which is why dip packages are not very practical for any chip of a, uh, of a realistic size. In that case, the only uh, practical packages are either uh, surface mount packages, PGAs or BGAs. Surface mounts are the easiest packages to understand because they are very simple and, and they are really um, kind of the natural progression of dip packages. So in surface mount, the pins come out of the periphery of the of the perimeter of the package. And they also usually come out of one of two sides, but sometimes from all four sides. Uh, 
And what they do is as they come out, they don't make a very sharp angle and go down. Instead, they make a gentle angle and they just kind of uh, straighten out towards the bottom like this. And so you have this kind of shape happening. And this can still be installed by simply soldering on the uh, PCB, although there's no hole that you have to cut through the PCB. Although that might seem simpler, it's not actually uh, that much simpler because, um, because of two things. First, you need to align the, uh, the package very well on top of the PCB. You don't have cut-through holes that guide you. And secondly, the thing about uh, surface mount packages is that because the, pitch, because the uh, pins don't make a sharp angle downwards, they can now be made much narrower. And because they can be made much narrower, the pitch between pins can be made smaller. And because the pitch can be made smaller, the density of pins can be made larger. And therefore, you can have more pins around your package, which is why you could have some practical pr processors that actually use surface mount. The problem or the cost of the, the price that you pay for this is that installing surface mount chips is not as easy as installing dip chips. So I said that dip chips can usually be installed by amateurs using uh, a manual setup. Uh, experts can install surface mount chips uh, manually, because, but amateurs or beginners will have a very hard time doing so. And any practical way in which surface mount chips are installed has to be automated, just simply because the, the, the pins are really close to each other. And therefore, the tracks on the PCB will also be close to each other. And it will be very easy to create an unintended short between these pins if you try to install it manually. Now, with very large chips, especially those that contain microprocessors, the perimeter of the, of the die is not large enough to accommodate all the pins that we need, even with surface mount technique. So in such case, what we end up having to do is we have to use the bottom of the, of the package to contain the, uh, the pins. In that case, you're opening a two-dimensional space for yourself and you allow yourself to have a lot more pins than you would have on the perimeter alone. So the simplest way of doing this, the most uh, obvious way is to do a pin grid array, PGA, in which case you have an array of, uh, of, of pins um, in this case, it's a square array of, of pins. You can see the side view here and the bottom view here. Now, these pins are this pin grid array chip. Uh, is going to be installed on top of a PCB, but it usually needs a special mount into which it plugs in, and then that mount will route the pins to the uh, correct copper tracks. The ultimate kind of package is the ball grid array package. This allows even more density than pin grid array packages. And you can see here the bottom view and the uh, side view or the elevation of a, a ball grid array chip. Again, it is the bottom of the package for uh, pins. So the pins in this case are not actual pins. They're actually solder balls. So what you see here, these are solder balls. Uh, this is the soldering material that you would use yourself to uh, attach the, the, the chip to the PCB. So you would use some soldering material here. This is already included on the bottom of the, uh, of the ball grid array chip. And it's of course in solid form. So it's included in solid form. What this requires is a very special installation techniques uh, so that the chip can be properly mounted on the PCB. This installation technique is highly involved and cannot be done manually at all. In fact, it requires a clean environment, relatively clean, of course, not like an environment used for photolithography, but it needs a controlled environment and automated processes so that it can be mounted properly. The mounting technique is uh, most often used to install ball grid arrays. It's called flip chip. And we can see the steps involved uh, in flip chip installation here. So in the first step, we see the bottom view and the side view of the uh, finished chip. And the blue rectangles that you see here are the bonding pads of the chip. So the bonding pads are actually protruding out of the package, which is really strange. And then you insert, you cover these bonding pads with uh, solder balls, basically. And so these solder balls are solid. And then this is the PCB, and these are the conductive tracks on the PCB. You have to flip 
the chip so that it is on top of the PCB and the solder balls have to uh, align perfectly with the uh, copper tracks of the PCB, which is why you need machines to help you in this alignment. And then we use heating. And when you heat this whole setup, the solder balls will melt. When they melt, they create a contact between the metal uh, uh, bonding pads on the chip and the copper tracks on the PCB. The amount of heating, the temperature to, to, to which we heat and the amount of time we leave the setup in heat has to be controlled so that the uh, solder balls melt and create a contact, a solid enough contact, both electrically and mechanically between the two uh, metal layers. But it doesn't, it cannot be uncontrolled because otherwise the solder balls might uh, melt too much and create shorts between adjacent pins. So again, this is why this has to be tightly controlled. When this is all done, Notice that you have a lot of exposed conductive material at the bottom here, including bonding pads for the chip. So you have to create some kind of protective layer around it. So you create a, a protective layer of an insulator of some sort here. Um, this could be an epoxy or a glue or something that is electrically insulating and at the same time creates a solid mechanical contact between the chip and the PCB. So you can see that the price that we pay for more pins is in more complexity.